Hello everyone, this is Lisa De Nicolets back again with I Read Somewhere That. And since we last chatted, I have decided to in fact credit where I get the comments that I find. I am just concerned that um, it's a certain plagiarism in a way because these, if I don't, because these are not things that I've said, these are things that I have read. And you may wish to go and look them up and see the context within which they were said um, and, and discover more information. So um, welcome to post number two, and I hope you are enjoying this as much as I am. And I'm going to kick off talking about opening lines of novels, because that's one of the things we are taught the most important thing. So um, this comment is from Rachel Gardner, a literary agent, and she says, Let's talk about the opening line of your book. The first thing to know about first lines is that they are not going to make or break you. Sure, it's a lot of fun coming up with great ones. But as long as the first line makes someone want to read the second line and that line makes you want to read the third, you're on the right track. The second thing to know is that the opening line might be the very last thing you write before your book is finished. So I thought that was fantastic. And then she goes on to um, list a few opening lines. So it is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. That is from Jane Austen, Pride and Prejudice. Next one. If you really want to hear about it, the first thing you'll probably want to know is where I was born and what my lousy childhood was like and how my parents were occupied and all before they had me and all before David Copperfield kind of crap. But I don't feel like going into it if you want to know the truth. And that was from J.D. Salinger from The Catcher in the Ryan. I think you should probably look it up because I think I read that rather badly. So forgive me for that because that is a great opening line. Then there's, once upon a time, there was a woman who discovered that she had turned into the wrong person. And that's from Anne Tyler, back when we were grown-ups, which I thought was fantastic. Very recently, I came across, across this one from a soon-to-be-released novel by Irene Marquez, who's an Inanna Publications author. The book is Daria. And I just thought this was so beautiful. I write myself in the intervals of a lifetime to see if I find my true name. I thought that was really fantastic. Another one that caught my eye is from Everything Turns Away by Michelle Berry. And it starts like this. When the babysitter wakes, she is in a strange kitchen. It is dark. Her neck is stiff and she is bent awkwardly over a table leaning forward on a hard chair. So that's probably um, more than one sentence, but it really it really caught my eye, and I most certainly am going to continue with that one. Um, next up, something that caught my eye was this on author bios, and uh, I thought this was kind of funny. If you're trying to sell nonfiction, your author bio is one of the most important parts of your pitch. If you're selling fiction, it's less important, but a good one can still significantly boost your manuscript's appeal. Prioritize authority and numbers over charm. The number one point of an author bio is not to make agents and editors love you. It's not zaniness or precocity. It's attracting financial investment in your book and long-term career. In particular, the very first sentence of your bio should be something impressive and career-related. It should not be a yarn about your childhood or family. Those things can come in shortly thereafter, but at the very beginning, for God's sake, toot an air horn about your career. And that is from Anna Sproul Latimer, and that newsletter is from the Neon Literary Agency, and it's, it's a really good one. Then another newsletter that I subscribe to is from Michael Pietrach, and that is um, so you want to write.org. And he posted this passage that makes us think. It is the basic condition of life 
to be required to violate your own identity. At some point, every creature with, which lives must do so. It is the ultimate shadow, the defeat of creation. This is the curse at work, the curse that feeds on all life, everywhere in the universe. And that is, of course, by the extraordinary Philip K. Dick, which, I mean, what I just love Philip K. Dick. Um, so the next thing that caught my eye was from a newsletter called Friday Things by Stacey Lee Kong. And she offers this, um, all of which is to say, if you want to performatively worry about what this world is coming to, perhaps apply that outrage to the fact that writing something true is no longer an actual requirement for publishing nonfiction, question mark, exclamation mark. So that's a really good one to check out in the context in which it was said. Um, I, I really enjoy her posts a lot. And I'm going to finish off with um, a quote by uh, the publisher of Sutherland Press, Kenneth White. His new newsletter is Shush, and uh, uh, there's always something interesting popping up there. And his comment is about CEOs. I worked for two different CEOs of multi-billion dollar companies who told me without a trace of shame, and perhaps with a hint of bravado, that they never read books. One simply wasn't interested and the other pleaded time, which is the same thing. You've probably seen those internet ads that claim that the average CEO reads a book a week. That's bullshit marketed by Blink Blinkless to flog 15-minute book summaries. There's no data to support it. The average American reads 12 books in a year and high earners read 15, which is probably the best case scenario for the average CEO. So I thought that was really kind of illuminating. And I hope you've all enjoyed this podcast and apologies for my stumbles as I go. I will try and improve with my elocution and I'll be coming back to you soon with some new buzzy snippets. Over and out. Thank you. Bye.